Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with James Wentdorf, Executive Director of the National Center for Learning Disabilities, or NCLD. Since 1977, the National Center for Learning Disabilities has been improving the lives of all people with learning difficulties and disabilities. Jim has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Thank you. Learning disabilities is such a broad spectrum of conditions, attributes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and ways of, of thinking and experiencing knowledge. Talk about the scope of, of the people that you serve and, and, and the various conditions that they may have. It is broad. And, and that's also a challenge, I think, for us and for parents and others in the field to really define what those learning disabilities are. One of the, I think, most exciting things that's happening in the field and specifically with NCLD is that we're looking at an even broader range of issues, learning and attention issues. Certainly, learning disabilities, disabilities like dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, reading, math, and writing disabilities are sort of at the, at the center, they're the core of that area of learning and attention issues. But we're, we're really considering um, a group of people and addressing a group of people that constitutes one in five. It's 20 percent of the population. And the challenge for us uh, and the opportunity for us is, is to go beyond the one in 20 individuals, school children, who are formally identified at this point and, and do additional work with the, the other children and adults who aren't formally identified but who struggle and who meet these challenges on an everyday basis. So you're, you're actually creating not only a change for the 20%, mm -hmm. you're also creating a change for the 80% whose brains are also quite diverse and they're shaped differently. Thank you for making our case for us because that's exactly, that is exactly our point. Um, the 20% of kids with neurodevelopmental issues, um, you know, if you don't get it right for them, you can't get it right for no, everyone else. Ab absolutely. And it all goes to this issue of establishing, you know, a, a level of understanding so that teachers can do their job and do it, you know, really well. Um, you know, kids come into the classroom, they come in with all sorts of issues, some of them uh, internal, um, things going on in, the, in their brain wiring. There are all sorts of stressors that happen in kids' lives, domestic violence, um, the, the effects of poverty. But what's, you know, what we see is that the impact of anxiety, the impact of stress on young learners is profound. There is, there is research that shows that it has a direct effect on brain development. Um, and it absolutely has an effect on whether kids are prepared to learn and has an effect on whether teachers really know how to adjust and calibrate their teaching in order to ensure that each child is able to demonstrate what it is that he or she knows and has learned. So let's talk a, a bit about the programs mm -hmm. of, of the National Center. But before we do that, how mm -hmm. was it founded? It was founded in 1977. Who, who founded it? We're, the founder was uh, Carrie Roselle and her husband, Pete Roselle. And, and we are parent founded. We are currently and continue to be led by parents on our board of directors. And our primary program is focused on parents. So that kind of that parent DNA is, has been with NCLD from the beginning. Um, and we've had wonderful chair people. Carrie uh, Ann Ford was our chair for a dozen or more years. Our current chair is Fred Poses, uh, who's the former chairman, CEO of Train Inc. And uh, all of them parents of kids uh, with learning disabilities and who found that their own journey, um, you know, their own journey as a parent uh, was certainly a challenge, difficult and continues to be as their children age. So when you came mm -hmm. to the National Center, what did you find and, and where are you today? Well, I, f I, I found and, uh, and I knew that NCLD was an absolutely uh, wonderful organization, a treasure, if you will, um, but sort of a treasure under wraps, 
um, uh, had not really achieved its potential, had not you know, yet really lived up to its name of being a national center. And so the operating budget uh, 15 years ago was about $1.5 million, privately funded, mm -hmm. um, and largely through the support of the board and through a major benefit dinner. But yeah, 10 or 12 people? Uh, but yeah, only, you know, only about 10, 11 people on the team. Um, and, and, and without a strong strategic direction. I mean, there was no strong direction. I was brought in very explicitly to, you know, to do more, <laughs> you know, and, and also to build programs. My own background, uh, you know, has been on the program side of not-for-profit right. work. I love building programs, building partnerships, and, uh, and building organizations. When I arrived at NCLD, uh, we, uh, while we had a website, um, we were providing most of our service via telephone through a warm line system. Parents would call up and say, I'm going into an IEP meeting in three hours. They're figuring, trying to figure out, how do I go in and meet with these uh, school personnel and make a case for my child, you know, needing more services, needing supports. And, uh, and we would scramble and provide information over the phone. We would send information via mail. We were, we were serving about 15,000 families every year. Um, this last month, through our main website, ld.org, which is focused on parents and helping parents navigate the whole school journey, um, we reached and served 700,000 parents in one month. So. By converting um, the, the technology from yeah. being a warm hotline right. or warm line mm -hmm. into a knowledge base, an online knowledge base with right. algorithms that mm -hmm. parents can follow, question mm -hmm. and answers, mm -hmm. um, and then links into other sources. Right. We um, you know, providing depth of information, breadth of information, so and and it allows us to maintain quality. Over, over that information so that uh, a parent in Alaska uh, can receive the same kind of information that a parent in Massachusetts w would receive. Um, now we are on the threshold of something new and uh, I think absolutely game-changing for the, the field of learning and attention. Um, and in the summer of uh, 2014, there will be a new website, a new web ecosystem, if you will, launched and we are very you know very centrally involved in the development of that web ecosystem we're working with nine other not-for-profit organizations we're working with five funders family foundations um, who have pooled their talent and their expertise uh, and their resources in order to create this new entity it's called understood.org and the, uh, the focus of it, the purpose of it, is to provide parents with the kind of personalized support and information and resources that up to this point had been available only to parents who were able to go to private sources, very expensive sources, to get that kind of information. Plus you have the emotional exhaustion that parents feel Mm -hmm. and, they're, and parents are very vulnerable. And anxiety, fear. And anxiety. Um, it's like, what is going on? We, we, we see something happening uh, with our daughter. We're not sure what it is. I don't understand it. Where can I go for help? And, and so NCLD, but especially now um, understood.org, will be the place where that kind of understanding can actually take place as, as the first step in a journey which could lead to what you just mentioned. What is dyslexia anyway? What, is, you know, what does that look like in a child? Um, and this site will, will actually have a section called Through Your Child's Eyes and, and a set of videos that will demonstrate for a parent what it's like to have dyslexia. What, it, what is it like to have ADD? Um, and, and just in the... Uh, you know, we've, we've run these videos and shown them to small groups of people, and for the first time, you know, people have said, I finally understand what my child is experiencing. I, I never really knew until, until I saw it this way. And, and there's also a tremendous development of, of assistive technologies <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, that uh, allow 
uh, children to do the iteration that they may need to do or to, to uh, hear and absorb knowledge in mm -hmm. ways that are more tailored to their own strengths, mm -hmm. but also circumvent some of their weaknesses. Yes, I, and I would say, you know, the growth in assistive technologies uh, is again one of the most exciting things in our field. It benefits everyone. I mean, curb cuts and sidewalks, for example, benefit all of us, uh, so we don't have to step over curbs. It's not just for individuals who are in wheelchairs who need those curb cuts to continue, you know, on the sidewalk and assistive technologies related to text-to-speech technology right. so that those who <clears throat> have trouble decoding but can, you know, can process and comprehend if they're, you know, when they can ear read, if you will, rather than sight read, um, all of those are greatly beneficial uh, well, to others who, as well. Who can understand concepts but don't remember dates and don't remember mm -hmm. names, mm -hmm. right? right. If, if, even if you if you just look at the technology surrounding and the, and mm -hmm. the approaches surrounding uh, whether knowledge is being absorbed. So if you're testing for things mm -hmm. that places a decoder at mm -hmm. a disadvantage, mm -hmm. but really is not indicative of engagement or even an ability to learn or, or native intelligence, mm -hmm. um, is just indicative of a skill set, a, a decoding skill set. By simply mm -hmm. shifting the exam, Mm -hmm. into concepts and patterns and, and other uh, ways or the interactions mm -hmm. um, that might happen in a particular historical era, you then afford somebody the ability to express their, their intelligence mm -hmm. and give them the sense of, of success. It's not a fake success. It's based on real accomplishment of the student. And it's, yes. it's just a, yes. a matter of having the teachers think about this differently. Um, and that's um, and that will uh, that will take some work. Yes. Um, you know, some people um, are hung up on, for example, to your point, thinking thinking about reading um, as the ability to decode. Um, well, decoding is a, is a means toward an end. That's right. I mean, you read in order to comprehend something, to understand it, to be able to feed it back in your own words and demonstrate that you really do know it and understand it. So education and teaching and learning that focuses on the ends and and pays not less attention to the means but finds ways to deal with those well, means. Well, reading is a technology. Right. Yes. Reading yeah. is a Print, technology. Print's a technology. Print is a right. technology. Right. Right. And uh, so, uh, so some of the debates that we actually have on occasion with, with uh, uh, test makers, you know, uh, uh, psychometricians who, who are figuring out how to assess reading um, and determine whether a child actually has, um, you know, a certain level of achievement. Um, well, if, if the assessment is focused simply on decoding skill, we know that, you know, you know 10 to 15 percent of uh, the population is going to fail pretty miserably. But they may be absolutely brilliant at comprehending what's behind the words. Just use a different means of getting there. So, so talk about the operating model for the National mm -hmm. Center mm -hmm. for Learning Disabilities. Um, we're headquartered in New York, in Manhattan, and we also have a policy and program office in Washington, D.C. Um, so we are very active uh, in policy work and advocacy work. Um, and have been for the past uh, 15 years. Um, our focus as an organization, we're about uh, there will be about 40 of us on the NCLD team uh, by the end of the summer. Um, and the focus um, is on three things, essentially. One, it's empowering parents. I mean, providing them the information and support um, so that they can advocate effectively for their children. Uh, in schools and most of our focus of course is on parents whose kids are in public schools, charter schools. Um, but all of our information applies no matter where the child actually is, is uh, going to school. Um, our second focus right now, and it's, um, it's something new for us, is, uh, is focusing on the, the needs, the aspirations, the strengths, and the challenges of teenagers and young adults <clears throat> as they transition from school into post-secondary, whether it's to college, four-year, two-year vocational programs or directly into work or into military service. Um, we are excited about that. That, is, that has 
been a neglected area yes. for our field. Um, and the, the range of need there is, uh, is huge. Um, and there are some exciting things happening. So our approach to it um, is, again, let's, let's understand the kids. Let's understand these teens and young adults. So we've conducted uh, qualitative research. We're about ready to, uh, to do a quantitative survey, online survey, with a representative sample of young people. And based on that, and with the support of one of our key foundation partners, uh, we're developing an open source data set for the field. Uh, here's what we've discovered. Here's what we think that NCLD um, might want to do with this information to develop a service um, for young people. Uh, but here are some other things. Here are some other learnings that would be perhaps uh, you know, really applicable to other organizations in the way they've approached um, their own work. So this is part of the constellation of open educational resources mm -hmm. that others can mm -hmm. access right. and that they can then exploit mm -hmm. and evolve mm -hmm. and contribute to exactly. over, over the next exactly. years. The, the third area of focus for NCLD is policy and advocacy work. Um, uh, up to this point, we've been primarily focused um, on federal legislation. We've had our hand in shaping, you know, key laws over the past 15 years, whether it was No Child Left Behind or the Special Ed Law uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, the Amendments Act related to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the Higher Education Act, and and so forth. Um, so we. Um, we essentially lead the, you know, the LD field in this work. Uh, we do it uh, through coalitions. We do it through partnerships. Um, and we've been effective um, at protecting um, civil rights because, uh, because we're looking at a group of people who have disabilities and are protected by civil rights legislation. But also looking at increasing educational opportunity and workplace opportunity for young people with learning and attention issues. That's our focus, that's our goal. Um, one of the exciting, another exciting uh, thing about understood.org is that it will feature a policy and advocacy platform on the site. Uh, much of your advocacy has been um, based on your history and, and based on uh, how you staffed, um, has been uh, pursued on a national level. Mm -hmm. um, are there plans to uh, to target particular states? There, there are. Uh, you know, as as we all know, a lot of decision making and, um, Surrounding and authority education. is certainly moving to the states. It's moved to the states, and and so we've taken initial steps uh, in a number of ways. Um, in terms of policy and advocacy work, we've already uh, been involved in a campaign in New York State. Mm -hmm. We anticipate um, identifying at least 10 states around the country, um, you know, uh, based on certain criteria because of what's happening educationally in the states, um, you know, what kind of innovations are happening As there. As key regional influences? Right, right. And, okay. and, and again, doing it undoubtedly in collaboration with some of the partners in the Understood um, Alliance, uh, but also with other grassroots organizations who are doing work, whether it, whether it would be in Colorado or Arizona, Georgia, Tennessee, New York State, or elsewhere. So that is certainly on the horizon. The other thing we're doing that's more geographically, geo-targeted, if you will, uh, we do, um, you know, we do work with school districts and with State Departments of Education as a trusted advisor, we are brought in by them um, in order to assess how they're, how they're allocating resources, are their programs effective, could they be doing uh, a more effective job of doing things. Um, our major geo-targeted uh, initiative for the next two years, uh, again with, with uh, foundation support from the Tower Foundation, uh, will be focused on a school district in Massachusetts <clears throat> and really working at the district, the building, and the classroom level and delivering in a combination of leadership development services and professional development services to administrators and teachers and helping them organize and allocate resources so that children who struggle can be identified <clears throat> earlier and more effectively. 
and reshaping our educational thinking and our educational system <clears throat> to engage these 20% of people who are our most precious resource. Our children are our most precious <clears throat> resource. They will dictate our future. To allow them, to afford them the opportunities of contributing their gifts to our lives is such an important, important task. So Jim Wentorf, thank you so much for giving us a brief glimpse into the work of the National Center for Learning Disabilities. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Thank you.